outset when he gave his welcoming remarks. So uh, Administrator Colin, welcome, and he'll be giving us our OSPR update. It's been busy, I know. Hey folks, what a great start to the uh, to the workshop. Um, I, I really wanna echo Jordan Stout, my old colleague from both here and my previous Coast Guard days. Um, when he made the point about the power of the uh, the network, our, our our team, and I was very impressed with looking at, I think the last count there were 337 of us that registered for the event, and that's certainly more than I think we've had in person in San Ramon. So, um, very compelling um, presentations on technology that's relevant in the present and anticipatory of the future, and that's what we're all about. Is uh, leveraging the advances of technology that we're uh, seeing. So since we last met in 2019, uh, as Greg just said, we've been uh, pretty busy uh, to tease out a couple of things, which I throw out there with the invitation uh, to perhaps have a sidebar conversation if you want any more details or uh, kind of hear about some of the things we've done. And these are in no particular order. Uh, we finally had a, a settlement in natural resource damage assessment from the 2015 uh, Refugio uh, pipeline spill down in uh, Santa Barbara County, uh, upwards of $24 million that will go toward a, a dozen or so restoration projects. And so uh, we're glad to have that phase of the um, the operation behind us and, uh, and looking forward to some of the projects down there that will be coming out as a result. Um, as we've ventured into the inland area of responsibility um, that we started back again in, in 2015. Um, we've uh, become somewhat experts along with some of our other state partners in um, inland spills, particularly a phenomenon called uh, surface expression, which is a result of steam injections into uh, a looser type of uh, uh, geologic structure that uh, allows um, if there's a, a compromise to the casing for oil to uh, be released and expressed to the surface. And we had a, uh, a spill of combined crude and um, produced water um, of more than 1.3 million gallons in a uh, part of Kern County uh, near McKittrick uh, last year that's uh, ongoing. No uh, actual water affected, pooled in a very remote area, but again, learning um, how to respond and respond safely, uh, you know, in, in that kind of a situation. We uh, promulgated just before this workshop last year, our final statewide regulations, and we continue to do rulemaking on our spill management team regulations. And, uh, you know, as a result of Assembly Bill 936, implementing criteria and standards for non-floating oils. Um, our team has been involved in some non-oil activities, contact tracing for the state, uh, fire debris removal from the disastrous uh, fires, particularly in uh, uh, Paradise up uh, north here in Butte County. Uh, and on top of that, we moved our headquarters in Sacramento back in December, just in time to go into about 100% telework in March. So let's talk about some of the other you know, more detailed things. Oh, let me find my button here. Here we go. So in 2020, we received reports of and responded to more than 1,300 uh, spills. We get reports in from the California uh, Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Now, about two-thirds of those um, reports, we were able to triage and respond telephonically, uh, but we did still send out, you know, um, members of our field response teams. We have folks uh, in Fairfield for Northern California, Bakersfield for the Central Region, and then Los Alamitos for Southern California. Uh, let's see, significant responses. So four days into COVID, uh, so back in March, we had a, a, a tanker truck roll off a, uh, a slick highway into the uh, Cuyoma River in eastern Santa Barbara County. And I'm going to go through a bunch of pictures here as I talk of um, what that looked like. So you can imagine four days into this very unknown new COVID world, trying to think about responder safety and realizing that all those things that we learned in Haswapper about the hot zone and decontamination and all that, well, the hot zone was actually probably the person standing next to you or more precisely, a large enclosed unified command with a whole bunch of people huddled over computer screens and paperwork. And um, so we had to develop 
a procedure, <clears throat> you know, um, for minimizing the number of people that were out there actually responding to the spill um, and leveraging technology to allow us, us to virtually perform a lot of the functions that we normally would do on scene. Uh, here you can see the area uh, of where that accident happened with some smaller pictures. I'll show you some bigger ones. Uh, this is about 13 miles upstream of a reservoir. So we uh, had a certain sense of urgency, as you can imagine, to get out there quickly. And here, in fact, you have a, a drone picture showing you know, the various uh, types of boom and uh, berms and uh, activities that were initially you know, put into place to, uh, to contain and uh, no oil made it further than about a mile and a half uh, downstream toward that reservoir. Um, here's a picture at the top of what the legacy unified command might look like that you're all intimately familiar with. And the bottom is the, the new age of response um, for many of us and uh, looking you know, to the future, it seems that that's gonna be the, the standard for some time. Ground level view of uh, the Cuyuma River with some of the, uh, uh, the supports, uh, sorbent and containment booms and crews not only uh, dressed out with Tyvek suits, but also showing uh, you know, some social distancing and, um, and masks. And thank goodness it was not much of a wildlife impact, um, you know, certainly not what it could have been. Uh, some small reptiles and, uh, and amphibians. Um, I think there was one kingfisher that was, uh, was found dead. And, you know, so lots of these old critters were able to be rehabbed and returned to the environment. So, um, a couple months later, July, we had a very big near miss with the uh, USS Bonham Richard fire uh, down in San Diego at the uh, US Navy base. Uh, a near miss because down deep in that ship that had a fire that was burning out of control for more than two days, there was 900,000 gallons of, uh, of fuel, uh, you know, diesel fuel, aviation fuel, uh, lots of hydraulics on board. Uh, and the ship started, um, uh, oh dear, my, I'm, I'm losing the uh, the uh, marine architecture term hogging. That's that's what it is hogging, meaning that it was starting to settle, bend at the keel, you know, uh, from all of the uh, fire water, uh, hundreds of thousands of gallons of fire water being pumped on board. Uh, so it was settling at the at the two uh, ends, the uh, the bow and the stern, and the navy was very concerned that the keel may fail, and um, and release a good portion of that uh, oil into the water. Um, and that, of course, would have been a, uh, a spill of disastrous consequences. So a big lesson learned out of this one, not just the online virtual command and control coordination of a response, but we really uh, realized how important it is to start um, improving our discussions with the Navy. Uh, they, to be candid, went on this really on their own. Um, and we had to have a, a separate kind of unified command set up at the Coast Guard base uh, further up, uh, um, you know, from where the, uh, the, the site is. And um, again, thank goodness that it wasn't uh, worse. And if those of you that don't know, it sounds like the Navy uh, has suspects arson and they are, are going to scrap the Bonhammer Shard. There's no way that it can be um, restored. Um, and then, you know, uh, my friend Mark Ross talking about the uh, unfortunate release uh, last week upstream, uh, well, upstream in Chevron's organization, his parent, you know, company, uh, Chevron Refining at their Richmond Long Wharf facility, uh, kind of right above the little dot you see above the, uh, the wharf, just uh, this side of it is uh, the general area of where the spill uh, happened. Um, this was the largest release of oil into the San Francisco Bay, I believe, since the 2008 Dubai Star uh, spill in Anchorage 9. And I do appreciate Mark's comments about how, um, how successful they and his uh, uh, partner companies, uh, our partners, you know, have been in uh, minimizing, you know, the, uh, the this release of oil into uh, our waters. And so here's some imagery of, you know, uh, the day one, you can see that there's a uh, sheen you know, uh, washing up on the uh, shores of Point Richmond. Um, you know, again, you know, light command and control uh, with uh, protective measures, you know, folks going out into the field and uh, doing some uh, shoreline cleanup assessment uh, technique uh, work, you know, walking the beaches, you know, lots of boom. And uh, toward the end of the spill, uh, which was, you know, the cleanup operations, you know, day two, 
Um, it, it came down to, you know, small boats just going around and chasing reports uh, or, you know, detections from the air of uh, small tiny sheens and putting pads down and wiping it up. So it's still under investigation, of course, both Chevron, Coast Guard and Osper are looking uh, at the response notifications, you know, actions taken. But um, I think I can say from my standpoint, uh, knowing that it's still under investigation, that um, I, I applaud the response community, Chevron for, you know, getting boats in the water, notifying MSRC, their contract oil spill response organization, getting boom and pads into the water and, uh, and containing it, you know, quickly. And certainly within the standards that we uh, set for our, uh, the, the drills that we put on our Osros. Um, one last picture, I believe there. Uh, some of the ongoing projects that we're doing at OSP right now, we haven't increased our principal funding uh, source, the per barrel fee that we assign to uh, oil that's going into the uh, California refineries at uh, six and a half cents per barrel, so per 42 gallons since 2012, before my time uh, at OSP. And so the effects of inflation have uh, eroded our capability of meeting our current mission. So we're going to be talking with the, are talking currently, with the uh, administration, with the legislature, uh, industry on uh, looking at a, um, uh, a, a fix to that. Um, of course, you're probably going to hear a lot during this workshop about renewable fuels and uh, shifts in trends in California. Uh, currently, our statutory authority does not extend beyond petroleum. And a lot of these renew renewable fuels, of course, uh, come from other than petroleum sources. Uh, it, it's a great thing for the environment, you know, for the, those greenhouse gases, you know, some say between 60 and 90% less carbon that uh, is released to the atmosphere when these are burned. However, we know that these fuels present every bit the threat to the environment, to habitat, to water quality uh, that its petroleum uh, partners do. And so we need to get uh, into this space and have the ability to, uh, respond and uh, set standards for response. Uh, let's see, clicking down. I don't know why the top one didn't shade, but that's okay. I mean, it's not uh, meant to be a, uh, a commercial here. Um, again, I mentioned how we're continuing to develop regulations for our spill management teams, uh, non-floating oils, and uh, you know, corresponding you know, a non-tank fee, you know, to mirror the uh, the fee that we're going to be hopefully uh, adjusting to our um, per barrel fee to sustain our operations. Um, this was a new piece of legislation that was passed last year that um, increases uh, the uh, fines and penalties due to um, spills in California. You can look that up if you're interested. And of course, these slides will be available. And then I'll be talking a little bit more about the ongoing problem of abandoned derelict vessels. Um, certainly in this COVID era, we've um, had to not just through response, but many of the other standing committees and groups uh, that we've been meeting, meeting virtually. And I would say, um, you know, keeping pace with everything that we need to do. This is just a list of the ones that I personally attend. Um, and there's many, many more, of course, that our, our team participates in. So I mentioned abandoned derelict vessels, call them ADV from this standpoint. So one of the interesting things before COVID, about 25% or so of our responses were due to this uh, threat vector. And uh, since we've gone into COVID and perhaps people not getting out and able to monitor or you know uh, watch their vessels as much or you know, whatever the conditions are, that's increased to a little bit more than 30, approaching 35% of our responses. And yet California as progressive as we are in uh, other environmental measures. Um, we do lag other uh, states like uh, Washington, uh, you know, Texas, even Florida, in addressing this uh, significant problem. You've probably seen this slide before. This is a survey we did a couple of years ago uh, by air of the uh, Sacramento and San Joaquin River deltas and mapping where there's not just individual vessels, but actually concentrations of these things. And, um, and when they uh, go bad, they go bad in a, uh, in a big way. Um, we're talking, you know, the main threat are not the small fiberglass uh, recreational vessels, but these formerly, uh, you know, commercial uh, vessels, you know, tugboats and so forth that, that might uh, sink. Well, there's a recreational vessel 
training vessel down in uh, Orange County, I believe. And oh, let me see. Here's a nest of you know some up in that that delta area. So we're going to be looking for, um, so hopefully, in this next legislative session, perhaps the next one of partnering with our uh, other, you know, um, state agency like the State Lands Commission and uh, Boating and Waterways and our federal partners with the Coast Guard Corps of Engineers, even uh, EPA, and try to find a way to uh, find funding and set up a program for those formerly, formerly commercial and military vessels that are just sitting there uh, rusting away and, and have, you know, pollutants on board. <clears throat> I tease you with a uh, slide of our geographic response plan efforts that uh, Anna Burke Holder from my office and others are continuing to work on. You can see how we have area contingency plans and colored shading all along the coast. And these GRPs, you know, reflect many of those aspects. And, you know, they might not be as broad in geography, but they are uh, certainly every bit as important. And they address, you can see up in the, uh, the northern part of the state, some of the more uh, sensitive and critical um, rail corridors like the Feather River Canyon, uh, Downer Pass, and and so forth, where there could be a, uh, you know, terrible things you know that would happen to the environment. And there's a list. It's a bit of an eye chart for you, I recognize, but you'll have the slides to see, you know, some of the watersheds that we're currently working on, and uh, a lot of the information on the regulations, on our responses, on um, GRPs, you know, contingency planning, so forth, are all available on our website at wildlife.ca.gov slash OSPR. And with that, uh, thank you all again for the, your participation, and I'll open it up to any questions you might have. And if you don't have them here in front of everybody, um, we can go one-on-one, -on -one, you know, sometime during the week. Thanks. Thank you, Administrator Cohen. Do we have any questions, Jenna or Lindsay? No open questions. How about that? All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you being Great. here.